just to begin to tell you that um, this all started when I challenged both Mark Gishin, who is a consultant for viticulture in southern Australia, and uh, Gregory Jones here, um, on to the next step of uh, uh, all this information on climate change. So we have been seeing a lot of data coming through, a lot of uh, predictions, a lot of uh, actually scary stuff um, and as, as um, a grower, as a, a wine producer, the question is what do I do uh, from this, um, from this uh, data and from, from all of this if I want to keep making wine and keep making profit. So this uh, presentation will be a preliminary account of a reflection we have done. Um, and um, let's start here. So for, for this, I mean, what we all are selling is uh, uh, a product that is driven in value by its taste, by its uh, sensory profile. So many times when we talk about uh, terroir um, and we market terroir, we are focusing on specific points of, the, of terroir, soil, climate, grape variety, practices, winemaking, viticulture, and so on. But quite often we forget that um, there has to be something more to terroir than just the conditions that create the wine. Those conditions have got to be reflected onto the taste, and that reflection needs to be recognizable by the consumer. So uh, while talking about this, we decided to propose this complementary understanding of terroir that actually brings in sensory perception to, to the concept. Because you can have a specific soil, a specific climate, specific grape varieties, and still make a wine which uh, you, you cannot uh, make the difference from your neighbors. Okay. So w w having this the sensory concept uh, bringing in, we start looking onto climate change on a, a different perspective because uh, you, uh, we will be able to see how um, climate change may stretch or even uh, go over the breaking point of your current uh, uh, terroir. So we have been a lot of things um, being uh, um, uh, on our future. I mean, advanced harvests, shifts of production areas and uh, usage of uh, grape vine of uh, varieties in areas different from where they originally came from compressed harvests increased hang time bushfire risks heat waves it's becoming especially on the more uh, southern latitudes it's uh, becoming more common and more frequent need to change management so that you keep profitable and sustainable um, and of course also increased refrigeration needs, which means at the grapevine level increased water needs and also at the winery level um, increased energy uh, needs. So we are, uh, and we have just seen that in the last two presentations, we are in for some uh, uh, complicated times. Uh, data from everywhere shows that. This is from Leanne Webb in, um, in Australia and New Zealand. We see uh, a prospective increase in temperature, but also, and maybe more uh, um, dramatically, an increase in variability. Um, Mary Retelak here in uh, Oregon has shown also um, a prospect for uh, um, ecosystem change uh, and uh, again differences in precipitation and increase in temperature and the group of Juan Santos, uh, the, the, the last speaker, um, has been shown also uh, very dramatic shifts for Europe in the next 100 years as we just saw. So when there are changes also consumption change and I cannot, I cannot uh, avoid wonder if it is the fact that bubbly starts being produced in southern England that has prompted the British to get out of the European Union. <laughs> so the problem is, and I work, for those who do not know me, I work in a wine company, actually the largest wine company in Portugal. Um, the question is, we 
know that something bad is coming. Okay? So what do, you, what do we do about it? I mean, data is everywhere. It's, uh, but it's not organized. And it's not usable for immediate decision making. Um, it's very complex. Even the information uh, uh, um, available may give you uh, contradictory uh, uh, perspectives on how you should cope. Um, time scales often are not very rel relevant for decision making. Spatial resolution is now starting to become relevant because we start to have one kilometer resolution, which is good. Uh, prior to that, we had 25, 30 kilometers resolution, which was not good at all, especially when you are dealing with countries that have small wine regions, even if they are a very hard value. And that all that makes for a hard deployment of this information. So these hurdles we try to sidestep. And what the, the, the three of us uh, uh, are proposing here today is to create a universal framework, terroir-based universal uh, framework, that allows growers and, uh, and companies to plan for long term. Because this is a long term industry, this is not a short, ter not a short term industry. So why a universal framework? Because we increase efficiency by avoiding replication instead of doing the same everywhere we are trying to complement our, our approaches. Um, by redu re reducing risk, therefore, we will also reduce cost and we will promote adaptation as a whole. I do not think that adaptation to climate change is something that uh, should bring competitive advantage to just a few companies uh, that will have, because it's just not workable that way. It needs to, to, to be done on a, a, a complete global way because the threat is also uh, global. And by having a single framework, you may make comparisons um, in, in simulations between different regions uh, so that by using uh, uh, the same method, you adapt to your own situation and derive your own solutions. But the basic method is, is the same. So the framework uh, works by five stages. The first stage means uh, uh, we'll identify which will be the key impacts of foreseen climate change. And by, uh, um, by detailing the processes, uh, we'll see if I can increase this a little bit. I may not. OK. So what you have here on the left side are different processes at different stages of uh, wine production. And the, the three columns to the right are the, the, the framework, the, the, the temporal uh, uh, lead time, sorry, the, 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 the lead time you need in order to uh, uh, do actions for, for uh, adaptation. For instance, site ch uh, choice for, for, for a vineyard, it's something that will work on the long term because you won't be changing the, the site of your vineyard every year. Okay. But on the other hand, assessment of water needs is something that w works on the three uh, uh, time frames. It works on the short term because you are looking at the growth cycle. It works on the, um, sorry, it works on the short term because you are looking to what is going on during ripening, for instance, or during the, the precise growth cycle. It works on the medium term because you can plan if you are expecting a drier or wetter uh, season and it also works on the long term in terms of water uh, uh, availability and uh, and um, management practices that allow you to be more e efficient in using water. So for the sake of um, of uh, explanation, we cho we chose uh, one of these processes that we will uh, use as a base for an example here today, which will be the setting of the harvest date. So. When looking into risk management, uh, and this has been extensively researched on, in another area, which usually we do not see coming to this type of, uh, of uh, event, which is uh, poli uh, policy making and uh, international affairs science, um, there are models for, for risk management in terms of just how credible is your information against to how severe is the impact. One of the such models that we retained was published by Vice in 2003. Actually, this is uh, uh, an American uh, researcher back east. And so what he has uh, shown, and you can see here, is that if you have on your left column 
the, the, the type of intervention that you consider to uh, manage a given risk and on your, on your, on your columns here the, um, the level of confidence on the information that supports that decision making, you can then have different stances towards that. For instance, Vice would call number one a curve the, the curve for an environmental absolutist, someone that just because of a belief would go into expensive and politically dif difficult measures. On the, ex uh, on the other side of the spectrum, you have the scientific absolutist, someone that would not do anything until it became clearly shown and, uh, and, and clearly convincing, and then they, they would rush to do uh, uh, everything they, they could, okay? So this, this creates different profiles of risk management that you can use. And what we have done was adapting this, this framework uh, a little bit more uh, so that you could um, uh, uh, decide in terms of what type of profile you, you, you want to use, um, what type of risk management uh, you would have. So this scoring that you see here uh, compares to the scoring for the profiles. You have here uh, what we have called the optimistic decision maker, the one that thinks it will be fine, um, uh, we will adapt anyway, so there's not, no much need to do anything, uh, that you also could call a climate denialist. Uh, and then you have the pessimistic decision maker, they're saying, oh God, we have to do something now, and then, even though uh, he doesn't really know what. Okay, so this scoring here will then be used on the, on the matrix in order to assess just what you need to have in terms of information to, um, to, to entail uh, an action, okay? So for instance, going for the, the harvest date, we now have uh, clearly convincing information that harvest date is pretty much advancing in most of, um, of wine regions. So using this, um, this uh, uh, matrix, um, a pessimistic decision maker uh, would already consider measures against more serious aspects uh, and formal plans for strong measure, measures, whereas um, a balanced decision maker would be considering uh, only uh, non, not very expensive actions and measures that can be taken without uh, a, strong, a strong impact and the optimistic one would just be uh, expecting and reassuring people nothing is going to happen, be calm. So, on stage four, you, we propose a framework for decision making based on the critical control point that has been identified from the previous matrix. So you identify that you have to do something, okay? So in terms of using this for, uh, for the, 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 the terroir uh, that you have, you would start by characterizing the, the, the terroir climate, establish the breakpoint limits of that terroir, just how hot it has to be to, so that the, the, the sensory perception of your terroir is gone, um, or just how dry, or just how wet. Um, then get information about the forecast climate, apply it to the analysis of resilience of your terroir towards what is forecast in terms of climate change and then identify, uh, identify the risks that you may be on to and also identify any possible opportunities that you may derive. So applying this to the example of the harvest date, you define the relevant climatic indices for harvest date, but also wine style indicators that derive from the setting of the harvest, uh, harvest date. <coughs> then you will go into your history looking at the data series and seeing which were the years where you did not have what you consider your, your terroir, the tipping points that you, that, you, that you went over. And that would establish your limits. Um, then calculate from forecast climate change what would be the ripening rates that you probably would have and compare the new ripening dates with historical ones, evaluate trends, magnitude of change, because that will give you 
a, a, an assessment of, for instance, how many years you won't be able to have your terroir being per, uh, perceived uh, sensorially, um, and also evaluate the probable effect on the variation of um, wine style indicators. Finally, you have the possibility of listing impacts on changes of wine style and start also listing uh, 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 possible actions to conserve wine style by managing your grapevine, by managing your irrigation, by managing your winemaking, by even changing varieties, changing rootstocks, changing uh, canopy management and so on, or and or starting uh, to envision with given uh, um, a change, what are the new styles that will be possible to make from your vineyard and start creating a new uh, uh, terroir. Finally, stage five is combining all these into an adaptation plan that you would then execute. So, as I told you, this is a preliminary work. Um, the main reason of being here with this is that now we need to have as global as possible uh, uh, an assessment from the community. And so we have set up um, a survey, a web line, uh, um, an online survey. We need your feedback from all of you. We also would like to have more people involved in this work and help us evaluate how the, um, the framework may work for each location. And even if you feel you can recommend other people, uh, we would like very much to have this work being shared among uh, uh, as many people as possible in as many locations as possible. Okay? So this is uh, the address where we have the, um, the survey. It's a survey monkey uh, uh, form. So uh, you'll be able to uh, go there and answer um, a, a couple of questions, which is what you see here. Thank you very much.